This is section five and chapter five of the thirty thousand dollar bequest and other stories by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The thirty thousand dollar bequest by Mark Twain, chapter five. The celebration went off well. The friends were all present, both the young and the old. Among the young were Flossie and Gracie Peanut and their brother Adelbert, who was a rising young journeyman tinner. Also, Hosanna Dilkins, Jr., journeyman plasterer, just out of his apprenticeship. For many months Adelbert and Hosanna had been showing interest in Gwendolen and Clytemestra Foster, and the parents of the girls had noticed this with private satisfaction. But they suddenly realized now that that feeling had passed. They recognized that the changed financial conditions had raised up a social bar between their daughters and the young mechanics. The daughters could now look higher, and must yes, must. They need marry nothing below the grade of lawyer or merchant. Papa and Mama would take care of this. There must be no misalliances. However, these thinkings and projects of theirs were private, and did not show on the surface, and therefore threw no shadow upon the celebration. What showed upon the surface was a serene and lofty contentment, and a dignity of carriage and gravity of deportment, which compelled the admiration and likewise the wonder of the company. All noticed it, all commented upon it, but none was able to divine the secret of it. It was a marvel and a mystery. Three several persons remarked, without suspecting what clever shots they were making, it's as if they'd come into property. That was just it, indeed. Most mothers would have taken hold of the matrimonial matter in the old regulation way. They would have given the girls a talking to, of a solemn sort, and untactful a lecture calculated to defeat its own purpose by producing tears and secret rebellion, and the said mothers would have further damaged the business by requesting the young mechanics to discontinue their attentions. But this mother was different. She was practical. She said nothing to any of the young people concerned, nor to anyone else, except Sally. He listened to her and understood, understood and admired. He said, I get the idea. Instead of finding fault with the samples on view, thus hurting feelings and obstructing trade without occasion, you merely offer a higher class of goods for the money, and leave nature to take her course. It's wisdom, Alec, solid wisdom, and sound as a nut. Who's your fish? Have you nominated him yet? No, she hadn't. They must look the market over, which they did. To start with, they considered and discussed Brandish, rising young lawyer, and Fulton, rising young dentist. Sally must invite them to dinner, but not right away. There was no hurry, Alec said. Keep an eye on the pair and wait. Nothing would be lost by going slowly in so important a matter. It turned out that this was wisdom, too, for inside of three weeks Alec made a wonderful strike which swelled her imaginary hundred thousand to four hundred thousand of the same quality. She and Sally were in the clouds that evening. For the first time they introduced champagne at dinner not real champagne, but plenty real enough for the amount of imagination expended on it. It was Sally that did it, and Alec weakly submitted. At bottom both were troubled and ashamed, for he was a high-up son of temperance, and at funerals wore an apron which no dog could look upon and retain his reason and his opinion. And she was a WCTU, with all that that implies of boiler-iron virtue and unendurable holiness. But there it was. The pride of riches was beginning its disintegrating work. They had lived to prove once more a sad truth, which had proven many times before in the world, that whereas principle is a great and noble protection against showy and degrading vanities and vices, poverty is worth six of it. More than four hundred thousand dollars to the good, they took up the matrimonial matter again. Neither the dentist nor the lawyer was mentioned. There was no occasion. They were out of the running, disqualified. They discussed the son of the pork-packer and the son of the village banker. But finally, as in the previous case, they concluded to wait, and think, and go cautiously and sure. Luck came their way again. Alec, ever watchful, saw a great and risky chance, and took a daring flyer. A time of trembling, of doubt, of awful uneasiness followed for non-success meant absolute ruin and nothing short of it. Then came the result, and Alec, faint with joy, 
could hardly control her voice when she said, "'The suspense is over, Sally, and we are worth a cold million. Sally wept for gratitude, and said, "'Oh, Electra, jewel of women, darling of my heart, we are free at last, we roll in wealth, we need never scrimp again. It's a case for Veuve Clicquot.' And he got out a pint of spruce beer, and made sacrifice, he saying, "'Damn the expense!' and she rebuking him gently with reproachful but humid and happy eyes. They shelved the pork-packer's son and the banker's son, and sat down to consider the governor's son and the son of the congressman. End of chapter 5